I want you to take a minute and think back over this past week or maybe it's this past month. And if you heard of a friend, or maybe you just heard about somebody be becoming a Christian, how did you respond? Or maybe you witnessed uh, the faithfulness in another member here. What was your response to this faithfulness? Were you excited? Did you pray for them? If so, what did you pray for? Did you try and encourage them? Was it even on your radar at all? Did you care? Or what about when you see fruit in another church? Do you praise God for this fruit? Are you disappointed or maybe even frustrated that it's not happening in your own church? Well, as Jeff just read this morning, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians. And if you're not all that familiar with the Bible, that's okay. We're, we're happy that you are here. The book of Ephesians, it's in the New Testament, and it's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. And in our text this morning, we're going to see Paul pray for a group of believers. He's going to give thanks for their faith. And then he's going to pray that the Spirit that sealed them would continue to work in them. There's three main ways that we're going to see that he prays. First, in verses 15 and 16, Paul is going to give thanks. Second, in verse 17, he prays that they will receive something. And third, in verses 18 through 23, he prays that they will know something. Well, these eight verses, Paul is going to give us, I think, a great example to follow. His example should work its way into our praying for one another, our praying for our own hearts, and even in our discipleship of one another. So here's my sermon in a sentence. We must pray for one another without ceasing, desiring one another to know and enjoy God more, always reminding one another to look to our future inheritance in Christ. Let me say it again. I know that was kind of long. We must pray for one another without ceasing, desiring one another to know and enjoy God more, always reminding one another to look to our future inheritance in Christ. Well, let's start here at verse 15 and see what Paul is thankful for. He says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you. So Paul begins with, for this reason. And to know what he's talking about, we got to look back to this previous section, verses 3 through 14, but really more specifically, 11 through 14. They show us this reason. He says, because you have been predestined by God, because you have hoped in Christ, that you have been sealed by the Spirit and given an inheritance that is guaranteed Oh, for these reasons, Paul says, he gives thanks. But that's not all. You see the result of their faith. It's working itself out in love for the saints. Oh, Paul is thankful that these once dead sinners are now alive in Christ. He is thankful that this new life in Christ has led to them loving the saints. I mean, this is, a, this is a picture of normal Christianity, isn't it? That it begins with being loved by God, which moves to love for God, which then moves to love for God's people. And he says that this work is evident in them. And it's not just Paul who sees it. Others have seen it, and they have told it to Paul. Oh, so he says he does not cease to give thanks for them. But again, he doesn't just stop with giving thanks. Look at the second half of verse 16. He says, remembering you in my prayers. You know, the New American Standard and King James Version both say, making mention of you in my prayers, which I think gives a slightly better picture of what Paul is instructing us to do. And, and by the way, this is not unique to the Ephesian church. When Paul writes these letters to these churches, this is often what he does. 
He gives thanks for their faith and he prays for them. So Paul is thankful for their faith in Jesus. He prays. And Paul is not just remembering them fondly. Paul is interceding on their behalf. He is actively praying that God would do something. So Paul's thankfulness for their faith leads him to encourage these believers that they are on the right course. And Paul prays that they would remain on this course, always moving forward, never being content with where they are spiritually. John Calvin warned against spiritual contentment when he said, For nothing is more dangerous than to be satisfied with that measure of spiritual benefits which has been already obtained. Whatever then may be the height of our attainments, let them always be accompanied by the desire for something higher. Calvin's saying that contentment with our spiritual life is dangerous. You must always press forward. You should always desire to know more and more of God. You know, in a lot of areas of our life, contentment is a good thing. Oh, but Calvin is right. When it comes to knowing God, we should never be content in our knowledge of him. We should always desire greater knowledge and intimacy with God, and not just for ourselves, but for others as well. I mean, is this how we pray for one another? You know, too often I think when we want to pray for somebody, we think we have to shut the door to our room and have these just hours of, of quiet prayer for it to do any good. But friends, I would encourage you that just throughout your day to have short prayers that you pray for your brothers and sisters. When you see evidence of God's grace, stop, give thanks for it, praise God for it, and pray that this grace would continue to grow and grow. And then go on with your day. I think if we did this more, this would help us to pray without ceasing. And what about our own hearts? Do we ever find ourselves being content with where we are spiritually? You know, are we like the guy who goes to the gym just to maintain their physical shape? Or are we asking God for more and more of him? And this should never stop. It doesn't matter how old you are, whether you're 15 or 90, you should never be content in your knowledge of God. Oh, there will never be a day where we know enough about God. He is incomprehensible. We can always, for all eternity, grow in our knowledge of him. And let me be clear that this is not just head knowledge. It's not just knowing things about God. No, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. This must be our desire, that our knowing God would lead to his glory and our enjoyment of him. Well, so we have seen already that Paul is thankful for these Ephesian believers. He doesn't just stop with being thankful. He intercedes on their behalf. He actively prays that they would know God more. And Paul is going to tell us more specifically in these next few verses what he prays for. He's going to pray for two things. First, he prays that they will receive something, and second, that they will know something. So let's look at the second point, that they would receive something. Look at verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. So what is it that Paul wants them to receive? Well, he says the spirit of wisdom and of revelation, but what is that? Paul has already told us that these Ephesian believers are in Christ, that they have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. So Paul's not asking that now they receive the Holy Spirit. He's not asking for more of the Holy Spirit. That would imply that something is lacking when they were sealed. What Paul is praying is that the Spirit would reveal to these believers what has already been made known about Christ. This is one of the things the Holy Spirit does for us. Jesus tells his disciples in the book of John that when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And Jesus had already told him 
that he is the what? He is the truth. So this is not a plea from Paul that God would reveal something extra. Again, this would make it seem that something is lacking in what had already been revealed. No, Paul is simply praying that the Spirit would make what has been revealed about Christ known more and more to these believers. Again, Calvin comments on the work of the Spirit saying, To the Lord opens them, the eyes of our hearts are blind. To the Spirit has become our instructor. All that we know is folly and ignorance. To the Spirit of God has made it known to us by a secret revelation, the knowledge of our divine calling exceeds the capacity of our own minds. I mean, basically he's saying, without the Spirit, we can't know God. And Paul prays that this spirit of wisdom would open the eyes of their hearts into knowledge of God. So when we are saved, the Spirit opens the eyes of our hearts that we might see the one true God for who he truly is and that we might see ourselves as we truly are. But then after conversion, the Spirit continues to work in us. He gives us greater insight into God's revealed word. He stirs our affections for him. He deepens our relationship with him. Oh, brothers and sisters, this should be such an encouragement to us. Paul is not talking about some extra blessing that we receive from the Holy Spirit. He is telling us what every believer has when we become Christians. You have God, the Holy Spirit. He is at work in you. He is giving you wisdom and insight into God's revealed word, leading you again to greater knowledge and enjoyment of God. So again, up to this point, we've seen the thankfulness of Paul. We've seen that he is thankful for their faith and their love for the saints. Oh, and it leads him to pray. He thanks God for their faith. He prays that they would actively work in him. That they would receive his spirit of wisdom and of revelation. That the spirit would open their eyes to the truths of the revealed word. And he prays that this wisdom and insight would lead to enjoying God more. And now we get to our third point in this prayer. And that is that these believers might know something. And we're going to see that Paul really prays specifically that they know two things. First, that they would know their hope. And second, that they would know the power of God. So let's look at the first thing Paul wants us to know. In verse 18, he says, Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. So Paul begins this verse with, Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Well, this is just a continuation of what he was praying that we would receive the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. He is praying that this spirit would enlighten the eyes of their hearts. Paul, Paul is wanting to make certain that it is God who reveals things to us. It is God who imparts wisdom. It is God who enables us to receive these things by enlightening the eyes of our hearts. Oh, brothers and sisters, this is why we must follow this example of Paul here. If we seek spiritual maturity for ourselves and for others, we must pray that God would reveal and enlighten our hearts. We will not grow in the knowledge of God the way we should if we do not pray that God, by His Spirit, would reveal wisdom and enlighten our hearts. It is God and Him alone that brings about spiritual maturity and the knowledge of Him. But Paul does not stop simply having their hearts enlightened. No, he prays that they would be enlightened to know things. And first we see that he prays that their hearts would be enlightened to know the hope to which He has called you. And to know our hope is to be looking forward, is to look to that day when we will be in the presence of God. I mean, we, we do this all the time, don't we? I can remember as a kid, 
I got through the school day always looking forward to something else, to the lunch break, to recess. I mean, I think oftentimes we get through our work weeks this way. We look forward to the weekend. But how much greater is it for the Christian? We get to look to that day in which we will be in the presence of God. We will be holy and blameless because we are in Christ. Paul is not merely telling us just to look to the future, though, is he? He's calling us to look to eternity. Brothers and sisters, this is so important for us to do with one another, is it not? Oh, to pray that we would know this glorious inheritance. That we would know that those who are in Christ have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. And because this is true, because the Holy Spirit is our guarantee, oh, this inheritance can be described elsewhere in Scripture as imperishable undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for you. Nothing in this life can be described that way. Everything we see with our physical eyes is perishing, is defiled, and is fading. This is why it is so important for us to take our eyes off of ourselves and to place them on Christ. I mean, how often do we do this? How often do we look to our inheritance? In our discipleship relationships with other believers, how, how often do we remind them to look to eternity, to see this glory and inheritance that awaits those in Christ? And why would this be helpful? Why would looking to our inheritance be something to be reminded of? I can think of two practical reasons, so I'm sure there are more. But first, it focuses us, again, to move our eyes off of ourselves and our circumstances and place them on Christ. You know, the author of the Hebrews tells us to do just that. He says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And he is seated now at the right hand of the throne of God. Oh, consider him who endured from sinner such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary and faint-hearted. Oh, he is telling us to be able to run this race unencumbered by sin. We must look to Christ. This idea reminds me of in Pilgrim's Progress, where Christian, when he leaves the city of destruction, he leaves with this burden on his back, which represents sin and his depravity. And so he leaves and he just feels the weight of this burden. And it's not until Christian looks to the cross that he looks to Christ that this burden falls off. And really throughout the rest of his journey to the celestial city, especially in difficult times where he is struggling to find hope or he is struggling with sin, he is reminded to focus on Christ. But second, it reminds us of this already not yet language used in Scripture, that this inheritance that we have in Christ, it is ours right now. We are already heirs with Christ. In chapter 2 of Ephesians, Paul says that we have been seated with Christ in the heavenly places. It doesn't say that we will be seated. It says that we have been seated. This inheritance is already ours. Nothing can take it away. There is nothing more certain for the believer than the inheritance that they have in Christ. You know, if, I, if I'm meeting with a brother who is struggling with contentment, maybe it's with his career, his financial situation, Maybe it's with his relationship with his wife, a roommate, a girlfriend, whatever it might be. I don't want to spend time just only talking about that specific issue. though that, That's important to do. No, I want to make sure 
to remind him to look to Christ. I want us to spend time reflecting on our eternal hope, anticipating the day that we will be with Christ, no longer plagued by the trials of this life. A day is coming where we will be able to enjoy him fully. That is what we should be reminding one another of. But look back at the text. It's not just this glorious inheritance Paul wants him to know about. So let's look at the remainder of these verses. What is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Uh, He put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we see that the second thing Paul wants them to know is the power of God. And he's going to show us these three areas in which we see it, and that's in Christ's resurrection, in his exaltation, and in Christ's dominion. Now, when you think of the power of God, what do you think of? You know, I I tend to think a lot of times of God's creation. He created everything with his word. He created mountains and oceans just by simply speaking. I mean, he created things so complex that some of our smartest brains still can't even comprehend them. Yet, that's not where Paul goes when he wants these believers to know about the power of God. Now, first, he wants them to see the power of God in raising Christ from the dead. In conquering sin and death for good. Doing away with it completely. That, Paul says, is power. And Second, we see his power by Christ being exalted to the Father's right hand. All through Scripture, this is a place of ultimate power and authority. Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father after finishing his atoning work on the cross. It's a sign of completeness. It is finished. And now he sits in his place of power and authority. And finally, we see he's been given all dominion. That everything in heaven and on earth is placed under his feet that there is no name in heaven or on earth that is greater than the name of Jesus. His dominion stretches through time, past, present, and future. It is over both the physical and the spiritual. Jesus Christ is the power of God, and there is none like him. You know, if you're here this morning and this sounds unfamiliar, I just, I simply ask, is this the Jesus that you've heard of? Is he the the son of God who came to die for the sins of his people? But as we have seen, he did not stay dead. That he rose again from the dead, conquering sin and death by the shedding of his blood. And after he arose, he ascended to heaven to sit on the rightful place of authority. This Jesus that we have seen this morning has been given all rule and authority, all dominion. And friend, it doesn't stop there. Scripture tells us that Jesus is coming back for his people. And that when he does, every knee will bow. And I pray that right now, if you don't know him, if this... this, Jesus, that we have seen this morning, if you don't know him, I pray that you would trust in him. I pray that you would come and find me, find another member here. Talk to us about what you have heard this morning. Because again, like we've seen, every knee will bow to him. And I I pray that when you stand before Jesus, because we all will, that you will be found righteous because you are his. Because if you are not, you will be cast out of his presence forever. 
Well, to close our text, we have seen that everything was subjected to him. And all this power was given to him. He was made head over everything. And why? Well, Paul says it's for the church. That's the incredible part of this. Paul says that this immeasurable power is for us. That God's powerful act of rising Christ from the dead, defeating sin and death, was done for us. Christ being seated in the heavenly places at the Father's right hand was done for us. And that his complete, all-encompassing dominion was done for us. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. This is why we must pray for one another without ceasing. We must pray that we would take our eyes off of ourselves and our current circumstances and to put them on Christ. You know, when you're meeting with someone who is discouraged that they continue to give in to sin and temptation, I'll point them to Christ, to the one who conquered sin and death once and for all, the one who is seated and is exalted with full dominion at the Father's right hand. Or when you're meeting with somebody now who is discouraged about what's going on in our country, these just the uncertainty, and they have anxiety and fear about it. Point them to Christ, our King who is reigning forever and will never be removed from that throne. Oh, and my prayer for our church is that we would pray and encourage one another to know and enjoy God more. I pray that we would have a longing to no longer just see our Savior dimly, but that we would each long for the day when these realities that we have seen here about Jesus, oh, that we will get to see them face to face. And I pray that we all would seek to encourage one another to look to our powerful Savior, to long for the day when we will see Christ. So friends, when you hear of someone trusting in Christ, pray for them. I'll give thanks for the Spirit's work in their life. Pray that the Spirit of God would continue to reveal God's Word to them, that they would continue to grow in their knowledge and enjoyment of God. When you hear or see the fruit in another church, give thanks for this. Oh, and pray that they would continue to grow in the knowledge and grace of God. And pray that we would be faithful to fix our eyes on Christ and that we would eagerly anticipate the day that he returns and we see him face to face.